All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, this is the Power Policy and the Radical Imagination session. Um, we're very excited that you all are here. We're excited to be on this rather big stage, uh, which feels a little awkward. So if you want to, I'm going to make the obligatory plea that if you want to come up towards the front, we please do. Um, but we're also very excited that there's going to be a, a podcast recording of this session, um, hence why we're in the room with all the AV. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and kick things off. Uh, my name is John Duda. I'm the director of communications here at the Democracy uh, at the Democracy Collaborative. The Democracy Collaborative is a national and now increasingly international research institute. And we like to think of ourselves as a research and development lab for the democratic economy. Um, and what we mean by that, well, first of all, with research and development, we're actually a pretty firm believers in the idea that we, we really don't know everything about the kind of new economy we're building together. Um, we know a lot about it. We have a lot of ideas that I think everybody is really committed to and shares. But in terms of the details, the structures, the models, um, there's actually a lot of work to be done to figure that stuff out, to, to, to think, to build, to create, to test, um, and to figure out how to make real. Um, so that's part of what we're about. And we're about the democratic economy because we really are committed to popular power. Um, popular power in terms of control over the economy, over our daily lives, over our workplaces, over what happens to our communities. That's both where we want to go, that's both our goal, and also how we're going to get there. Um, we're not going to build the kind of economy we want unless we find ways to center the power of the people in that. Um, so we're, we're not about a technocratic vision of a new economy. We're about one that's deeply democratic. Um, and that means we're excited about I both ideas and movements. We're excited about those two things working together um, to really create transformative systemic change. Um, and that's, that kind of change is important and necessary. Um, just speaking personally, I was born in 1977. Uh, so, you know, when I was three, Ronald Reagan was elected. So, like, literally my whole life as somebody living in the U.S., um, it's been 40 plus years of neoliberalism, um, 40 plus years of, uh, you know, a belief that the market is the only thing that will make society work. Um, and while there's been a lot of really amazing radical challenges to that idea, um, we're still not yet at the point where we've pushed through and broken um, the dominance of that idea. We're starting to see the cracks. Um, we're starting to see the places where that kind of really awful common sense, right? and I put common sense in quotes because it's not really, doesn't really make much sense when you look at it, but that ability to control and limit our imaginations of how we could live together, how we could work together, the kinds of, the kinds of world that we can build together, um, our imagination has really been um, severely, severely limited by decades and decades of relentless assault on any kind of alternative possibilities. And what's exciting to me about being in this space, what's exciting to me about being on the stage with people like this is that we're starting to see the cracks in that. We're starting to see how we can push through something that is really a radical imagination that connects to popular power and really makes change happen um, at the level, not just of a small project, a small exception to the rule, but starts to really change the rules of the game itself. Um, and that's, that's where policy comes in, right? Because policy is where, for better or worse, um, you have a really great place where our kind of imagination of how things could be different um, can connect up to the power that we're able to build in our movements and get institutionalized as results, right? That's where we can turn our good ideas um, and our energy into something that's durable, that's replicable, that's scalable. Um, it's not the only thing we need. Um, I'm not gonna, you know, I don't think anybody up here is gonna think that policy is the, you know, the magic answer to all of our problems. Um, but it is this place where we can, we can really take the models that have inspired us and use the, what we've learned from them to really shift the rules of the game um, that we've been forced to play. Um, and it's not easy, 
right? Lots of things can go wrong. Um, lots of things can go right, um, but there's a lot of dangers and pitfalls along the way as we try and translate our movement energy and our imagination of what comes next into things that actually work when we, you know, try to get them past a, a, a legislature um, or, you know, get them to pass legal muster. Um, thankfully, we have three really amazing guides here. Um, to help us through this today um, and to kind of have a conversation about um, this connection between power policy and the radical imagination. Um, and all of these people are here um, you know, representing really interesting um, and transformative projects that are working both at local levels and at larger levels um, to make this kind of change happen. So first we have my colleague Sarah McKinley. Uh, uh, works with me at the Democracy Collaborative. She's the European representative for the Next System Project um, and part of our team who's been working really um, quite a bit around what's called the Preston Model, which is a comprehensive city-wide effort in the city of Preston in the north of England to shift their entire economy at a city and county level towards cooperation, towards community sustaining um, structures. Um, and it's one that really interestingly has kind of caught fire in the popular imagination, um, or at least the, the lefty popular imagination um, in the UK, and has become uh, part of the platform of the opposition party, Labour, um, uh, thanks to the work of Jeremy Corbyn and people in his office. Uh, next, we have Carol Askew, who's uh, an organizer with the United Workers, um, who I'm really happy to say is from my hometown of Baltimore. Um, and uh, Taro is a leader in a really, really um, powerful grassroots citywide campaign that's going on in Baltimore right now to confront the challenge of gentrification and displacement head on and propose new structures for permanently affordable housing. And it's based in a, a really amazing deep process of co-learning, of leadership development, of, of community engagement, um, and really looking to build alternatives um, and get those alternatives financed through uh, the public resources that we should all share, but are you know, all too often given to the developers who are well connected to um, leverage you know, their influence on politicians into greater profits. Um, so I'm excited to have Terrell here to talk about that fight, um, which I think is really, really crucial. And finally, Ali Issa from the New York City-based New Economy Project. Um, this is, I, I think, a really powerful, powerful organization that I wish more organizations work like this in that they're able to fight back against things that are going wrong. They're able to mobilize and advocate about what's wrong with the economy, um, but they're able to do that in a really integrated way that pushes forward solutions at the same time. Um, and that combination of, of you know, fighting injustice with everything you've got, um, but at the same time being ready and able to propose what, what should be in its place is one that I think you know, a lot of organizations could learn from, and I wish more organizations worked like that. Um, and Ali is here to talk about their brand new, um, it's been a long time in development, but it's, it's just gone public, I think in the past couple of weeks, um, their new campaign to create a public bank in New York City, um, right in the heart of you know, one of the nodes of global financial power, um, proposing a very radical, very public, and, and very sensible alternative. Um, I also want to shout out uh, Peter Sabonis, uh, who is here somewhere, and I can't see him because the lights are, oh, there he is. Um, Peter Sabonis has uh, been my co-conspirator on putting this panel together. Peter works with Nesri, um, uh, another great organization thinking about this nexus between organizing um, and alternatives and, and what economic rights are um, and how we want to build towards those. Um, Peter was really um, tremendously helpful in kind of helping conceptualize this and is um, going to be distributing some resources at various points and hopefully chiming in um, at points in the discussion. Um, and I do want to emphasize this is going to be a discussion. Um, I, I don't want this to be, especially given that you know we're up here and people are down there, um, we're going to you know, have a conversation up here and then we're going to open it up to people in the audience and really try and learn from what you all can bring to the table um, for this, this kind of conversation. All right, so with that, um, I want to start, um, you know, we could start with any one of these things, but I want to start with an idea um, and get an idea out on the table. So, Ali, I was wondering if you could just tell us, what's a public bank? Sure, thanks so much, John, and everybody for attending. For inviting us here, this is um, 
Yeah, it's really exciting as you laid it out to join you all. So uh, as John was saying, um, I'm the coalition organizer at New Economy Project. And just a little background about um, New Economy Project is based in New York City, as John was saying. It's an economic justice organization that works with community groups to challenge corporations that harm communities and perpetuate inequality. Also to build an economy that works for all rooted in racial and social justice, cooperation and ecological sustainability. Uh, New Economy Project has coordinated financial and economic justice coalitions and campaigns for more than 20 years, winning major policy changes, um, engaging in impact litigation, and, uh, and or facilitating organizing between coalitions for community land trusts and community controlled financial institutions. <clears throat> so the public bank campaign, as John said, has been an idea New Economy Project and other allies have been pursuing for, for several years but uh, just launched literally two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago, it was brand new. And um, just for a little context about New York and kind of how we have defined things, um, as we talk about it, a public bank is a bank created to serve the public and that's owned and controlled by a city, state, or other local government. Um, in our case, that means it would hold New York City's municipal deposits and then reinvest them in local communities and be accountable to them rather than to private shareholders, as, as most banks are. Um, so just an idea also about scale, um, New York City just this month recently passed uh, its fiscal year 2019 budget, and that's um, 90 billion, with a B, um, <laughs> that uh, mostly flows at the present moment through Wall Street banks, meaning that on any given day, billions are on deposit in <clears throat> Um, Citibank, Bank of America, and Chase having the lion's share, um, which of course implicates New York City in Wall Street's destructive practices, backing private prisons, financing war, uh, facilitating fossil fuel extraction, redlining, the list is, is, is long, long, long. Um, but it also means that that same money is not being um, put into the local economy and reinvested for community needs. So the vision for the Public Bank New York City Coalition, as we've called ourselves, um, is to back transformative solutions to problems um, <clears throat> that local people face and support community-led initiatives that allow New Yorkers to have determination over their daily lives. So housing, land use, food, money, and beyond. And those models are, have been growing of late in New York. So that the, the vision for for Public Bank NYC is to kind of support the flourishing of this new economy and have accountability to those communities impacted by the banks most of all. Cool. I think one of the interesting things about the Public Bank campaign in New York is just how grounded it is in organizing. And that's, um, uh, Taro, I think it's great that you're here to share with us what's going on in Baltimore because um, like what's going on in New York, uh, this isn't just an idea that's descended from technocratic heaven and a few people are trying to work on, but it's deeply connected to, um, to a process of grassroots organizing. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about you know, how you got involved in this project, what the organizing looks like, um, who's this organization that's building for this? Oh, um, sure. Um, to, uh, my name is Terrell. I'm with um, United Workers, which is a labor rights organization, and the Baltimore Housing Roundtable. Um, I got involved through um, two people from United Workers actually door knocking um, my neighborhood. Um, they were doing a housing survey to figure out the housing situation, um, renters versus owners, how affordable is your um, monthly bills, um, what are challenges you face in the neighborhood. and. Um, through that discussion and filling out that survey, I was brought to the attention, it was brought to my attention about the space of the Baltimore Housing Roundtable, which is a monthly meeting where um, people from throughout the city, residents, um, um, nonprofit developers, um, city um, council people, all the different myriad um, of people throughout the city come to discuss um, um, change, how to change the housing um, landscape in the city. Um, I also was, at, that, at my first meeting, I was, that's how I um, found out about 
uh, Greer, and that was my, that's my neighborhood association, my former neighborhood association uh, in Remington, which was the community I lived in. And um, through the looking at the housing survey, this kind of led um, to moving towards creating um, a, land tr um, a land trust um, project in that area. Um, I've been in, um, involved in a great deal of the organizing side of it. Um, I've gone from, door, from being door knocked to um, door knocking um, throughout the city, um, petitioning for different initiatives. Um, one was the, uh, which is it's called the 2020 campaign, 2020 vision campaign. And that it was an act of the city to put, to dedicate 20 million towards um, create, creation of permanently affordable housing and 20 million towards demolishing, deconstructing, and greening vacant properties. Um, we wanted this to come out of the city's um, GO bonds, general obligation bonds, which is just money that's, um, cre that's used to do, project, to, to do um, projects throughout the city on a yearly basis. And um, all of that um, is kind of grounded in the organizing because only through people power can you hold um, um, munis your municipal leaders and things like that accountable for the actions they, they do. Their budgets that they create are supposed to speak to our values is one of the things that we try to um, illustrate to them and ask them to look around their neighborhoods and to judge what things there that they see that they would not want there. What things do you want here? And that's kind of what led us in the direction of community land trusts. Um, tr truly giving people the opportunity to actually steer the direction of their neighborhoods. Hmm. Um, and I think um, I want to ask Sarah to kind of introduce herself a little bit and maybe tell us a little bit about the story of um, Preston and where this, um, you know, why you're working with folks in the UK now and where this idea came from. Yeah, thank you, John, and, and thanks to um, uh, the other panelists. It's great to be here. Um, is this working? Yeah. Um, uh, as John mentioned, I'm with the Democracy Collaborative with our Next System project and I'm now working in um, Europe and the UK to really build some connection between a lot of the uh, municipal efforts that are happening over there um, and learn from them and also feed some of our learnings here um, back into their efforts there. So um, it's been uh, really eye-opening and interesting and as John was talking about uh, limited imagination, it's really uh, it's really powerful to be in the UK where, um, you know, the birthplace of Thatcherite, uh, there is no alternative Tina thinking. Um, and the sort of neoliberal mindset of, of how to shape economy is, is deep and pervasive in, in the UK. Um, I would say probably second only to the United States in that thinking. And it's really interesting to see how uh, the breakdown of that neoliberal order is really being felt um, in a visceral way in communities across the UK and, and now you're really starting to see a bubbling up of solutions and alternatives that are coming from the places that have been most impacted, most negatively affected by these, um, these economic trends. And so uh, we've been working with a city, um, as John mentioned, called Preston in the north. It's about an hour north of Manchester. It's a post-industrial city, relatively small, mid-sized city, about 140,000 um, people, um, former cotton mill town. Um, and uh, you know, uh, uh, used to be a very industrial town, and sort of in the past 30 to 40 years has really been on a serious decline. Um, and for years, the the city was constantly trying to figure out how can we revitalize, how can we redevelop um, our city, how can we create sort of a new 
uh, new economic activity and commercial activity in our city. And, and the approach for many, many years was the one that I'm sure you're all very familiar with in your own towns. Oh, let's attract a big developer. Let's attract a big corporate commercial anchor um, for our city. Uh, that will create jobs. That'll create prosperity in our, in, you know, our main street. Um, and they went through a whole process over years of courting um, those developers to come into their city. And uh, after the financial crash, um, one of the big developers that they were working on to, that were um, promising, you know, uh, billions of pounds of reinvestment and X number of jobs in the community basically said, we're not going to do this anymore. You know, there's nothing for us in Preston. And, and uh, the city council, um, which was a labor council and, and still is, um, got together and said, okay, we can't keep doing this. We can't keep doing things this way. What can we do? Um, what other alternatives are there? And um, started looking um, in other places. And it just so happened that that year, 2012, was the year of the co-op. And there was a big gathering in Manchester um, uh, convened by the ICA um, to talk about cooperatives and the future of cooperatives. And there were examples from all over the world of, of cooperative economies. and. Um, uh, our executive director, Ted Howard, came to talk about what was happening in, in Cleveland, Ohio with the Evergreen Cooperatives and how those worker-owned cooperatives are connected to local institutional purchasing power um, and, and investment. And that really got them thinking about how, how that could work for Preston. And they went back um, to their city and started a whole collaborative process with um, six different anchor institutions. Um, and by anchor institutions, we mean institutions that are rooted in the community and aren't leaving. Um, and uh, in the US, we often think of hospitals and universities, eds and meds, um, and certainly they were working with those institutions, but they were also working with um, their police force as an anchor institution, their local um, social housing board um, as an anchor institution, the city government as an anchor institution. How could all these institutions in place think about the way they were spending and redirect it um, in a way that boosted local um, economic activity and connected directly to, to people there. And in the um, intervening five years, there's been a huge reinvestment um, uh, directly in, in uh, Preston and also in the county, 70, um, 75 uh, million pounds um, re redirected into Preston economy by the anchor institutions, um, almost 200 million pounds in, in Lancashire, the county. Um, and then also they've actually managed to reinvest a fair amount, 100 million pounds, in uh, from their local pension, the city pension fund, into um, local development in in the community. Uh, they now have a city-owned marketplace. Um, they're developing a cooperative network um, to fill in the gaps. Uh, they're working on an ener a local energy, community-controlled energy um, program. Um, and they're hoping to further use the pension fund to help capitalize a local bank um, owned by the city. So it's a really interesting model um, in place uh, that has started to influence some of the national level policy um, going into effect um, with the shadow labor government. Um, uh, and there is a, a strong possibility that that shadow labor government could be the next national government um, for the UK, which really uh, you know, presents itself as a huge opportunity, um, a huge challenge as well, to see some of these local efforts, what does that look like when applied at a, at a national level policy um, scale. Thanks. Um, one of the really fascinating things to me about Preston is that while many people may have been thinking about ways to do things differently, um, it really took that moment of crisis where it really hit home for a, a critical mass of people right. uh, to make an alternative possible. That's right. um, and you know, I think about Baltimore where Tara and I live and you know, Baltimore's been in the middle of a, a slow crisis and um, a long, deep crisis and it looks different in different neighborhoods. Um, and I think that's one of the things I find fascinating about um, the work that you're doing is that you're connecting it with people's needs, but you're doing it at a you know a neighborhood to neighborhood level. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about you know what does a community land trust mean um, you know for somebody living in Remington, say, versus another neighborhood in Baltimore, and how are you organizing together? Well, um, uh, thank you. Um, well, one of the things that we realize um, is that. Because um, Baltimore City is such a city of neighborhoods, 
as opposed to a true, like, unified beyond, um, past those um, man-made boundaries. Um, a lot of the neighborhoods, Remington, for instance, had gone through a remarkable amount of development over a short period of time. It had kind of gone from a city, I mean, a neighborhood where 10 to 12 years ago, it was, you, you, just, didn't, you just didn't go there, um, to a neighborhood where people were like, jumping to move into. And so that caused housing prices to um, shoot up um, somewhere around 15,000 every year. And so, for instance, in Remington, there aren't a lot of vacant properties. And so it forced us to come up with a different solution for how to um, craft um, land trust opportunities there which is why we explored the uh, buyer-driven model, which would allow, um, would help us to create a subsidy that would allow um, people who wanted to live in the neighborhood but are being priced out or who are coming to the neighborhood but can't afford to live there to actually purchase properties um, that would stay within the land trust um, network. Um, as opposed to, um, for instance, we have another neighborhood, um, the Curtis Bay area, where they've had chronic disinvestment as Remington used to have, but theirs, their development has, has slowed to the point where they have an overflow of vacants. And this has led to um, like different tragedies that rallied them together. Um, they were a little bit further along than I was and my neighborhood was, for instance, in the organizing um, themselves. Um, they, fought, they, had to, they had to fight to keep uh, Bresco, which was gonna be the largest, um, uh, the largest, um, trying to think of the, I'm lost for words right now. Um, the, the largest incinerator, sorry. Um, the largest incinerator in the country oh. from being built. Yeah. And the, the, the um, issues that they'd already had were causing health problems and things like that. So these were points to rally them together. Um, and that kind of was that that kind of presence didn't really exist in Remington, so it wasn't quite seen as quite the crisis in Remington as it was in, there. So um, they're, they're, they have determined that rental properties um, through land trust and um, actually developing um, their vacants. Um, is 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 the more as the ne the necessary um, direction for them to go, in order to revitalize their neighborhoods. Um, basically, um, one of the things that we, as a group, came together and realized was to create like a hub and spoke kind of model for developing a citywide um, land trust, and the hub is called Share Baltimore. We just, um, we've, we incorporated um, earlier this year and just finished bylaw, well, just ratified bylaws, which is a hard process. <laughs> 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 but um, basically to help do two things, to help us um, because we knew that certain groups were further along in the in um, the land trust model. Certain people had already, two of our, it's six land trusts right now, like two or three more that are looking to be, to join. And two of those six have already acquired properties. Then you have the others that are in various stages working towards that goal. And so we it came, it was, we came to the realization that we needed a space that allowed us to work together because we realized that all of us had different skills that we could bring to the table, almost like peer mentoring. Yeah. Um, and 
then through the, um, sh the share space, we would also be able to advocate for more, for, for um, better policies and more funding um, in, these, in these areas, but especially going towards land trusts, which are seeking to address these issues as opposed to perpetuate them. Um, uh, well, I'm going to stop there. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. cool. uh, Elias, I, I want to come back to this question of around examples, right? And this idea, you know, that we see in, you know, certainly looking from Evergreen to Preston, there was this like, you know, aha moment because there was an example. Um, I think in the New York case, there's an interesting, um, it's interesting because you, we have one example of a public bank in the U.S., which is the Bank of North Dakota. Um, and I'd be curious to hear kind of what you've, what you've gotten out of the fact that we have a good example of a public bank and where what you're trying to do maybe doesn't match that example. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, and I mean, I think the little more context for that question is maybe people have heard, or I don't talk, there's kind of a national public banking wave and mm -hmm. um, you know, New York kind of launching uh, this month is, is added to that. Um, maybe you could say if it's in global, I'm, I'm not sure, I'd be curious yeah, to, no, yeah, to know. <clears throat> and, um, and yeah, there's, uh, there's one existing public bank in the U.S., which is the Bank of North Dakota um, that was created 99 years ago. Wow. So um, both 1919 and North Dakota, slightly different than 2018 New York City, <laughs> you know, relatively. Um, but yeah, a, a lot of the, um, you know, uh, financial stability um, they talk about from 2008 not being harmed by the crash in North Dakota as, as severely. Um, particular kinds of local investment that that bank has been able to accomplish are clearly important examples, things to study and look at and see how they do relate to um, the New York City context um, and, and, the, and the members of the coalition that we've built that have particular priorities and worked on campaigns. <clears throat> but I think the, you know, the main question is like if, if divestment, um, which, which many members of our coalition are, for example, working on private prison divestment and see that um, since the city of New York has invested in Chase, Chase backs things like um, a private prison and immigration detention centers, then a, a move towards divestment is to divest from Chase, so then you're divesting city money from those cages. Um, but that the question comes, if you divest, where do you invest, okay. right? Um, so as individuals, we could move our money from, say, Wells Fargo to a credit union um, or a, a community development credit union, which we could talk about, a mission-driven a financial institution, but a city's deposits are so massive that um, the, the present laws that are written don't allow actually New York to drop its money in credit unions, nor even if it could, could a, a credit union like Lower East Side People's Federal Credit Union, a cool example, handle billions of dollars. Um, so it necessitates, necessitates kind of a, um, an alternative uh, which would be owned by the city and would um, be structured so that it can handle those billions each day and um, an important example is that, you know, how Seattle had actually also moved to pull its money out of Wells Fargo, but then uh, in this past May basically had to reestablish its relationship because there was no, there was no alternative there. So, um, so yeah, I mean, engaging groups in, uh, in questions of, of what, um, what the model should, should really function as and beyond just a, a public bank existing for its own sake, might be an exciting idea to say Wall Street, you know, um, get out of our city. But then also, what is it going to accomplish, right? Are its effects going to lead to permanently affordable housing? Are they going to divest from private prisons, fossil fuel extraction, and, and, and redlining? Um, and holding up those values, I think, is, you know, is also a practical organizing matter because if you're approaching groups um, who have those priorities, who are talking about criminalization, of uh, black and brown communities, if you're talking about groups that are serious about climate change, want to find alternatives, then, then the bank must reflect that and into its vision, into its charter, and into its implementation must hold up those values if you're going to have that mass support which you're going to need fighting Wall Street. Mm -hmm. um, I, the Seattle example is just, it's, it's really brutal to me because, you know, when you have this energy to do something different, you have 
you know, this challenge to a major multinational financial corporation that like wins and then you can't make it happen because you don't actually have the institution in place. Um, and I think it's a reminder uh, when we talk about these policies for alternatives that institutions are slow. Um, building institutions doesn't happen overnight. Like I can't, we can't go meet out in the hallway and create an institution that's going to handle, you know, $90 billion a year in deposits, right? That's going to take a little bit of time. And Sarah, I was wondering if you could talk about this in the context of Preston, because it's been going for five years, um, but it's slow, but at the same time, the excitement has like exploded around it. It's been in The Guardian and The Economist and on the BBC. And is there a danger in people's imagination about alternatives getting ahead of what's actually being built? Yeah, um, it's actually a real, a real challenge and a real fine line to walk because as you were saying, sort of the power of ideas is, is really powerful and what's happening in Preston really is the seed of, of possibility for other places across the UK and other, other small um, cities all over. Um, but uh, So it's really important to be able to tell that story, but it needs to be told in a way that is understanding that this is a work in progress, that this takes time. Um, you know, there is a cooperative network in place, but there aren't yet cooperatives. The first one will launch this summer. Um, uh, and there's a whole ecosystem of support that has to go around that. Um, to create new institutions and new models is not an overnight process, as, as John said. And so, you know, there, there has to be, um, you know, we don't want to put the cart before the horse. We want to create inspiration and spread ideas, um, but understanding that, you know, the work is still being done. Um, and as we create, you know, as we spread hope and ideas and, and, and build imagination, we also need to make sure that we're bringing the resources along to do that. Um, so it's not just telling the story for the sake of the story, it's telling the story to understand that, um, you know, the resources need to be there to, to help this work come along. So, um, and, and the learning needs to be there in the exchange. Uh, for example, as I mentioned, they, they want to have a city-owned bank. They were looking at um, a German model, uh, the Sparkassen model of, um, uh, of locally owned banks. And, you know, uh, they went through a whole process of doing an analysis of, you know, whether or not that would work for Preston. And um, it turns out maybe it's not the greatest model to try try and replicate um, where they are, and now they're looking at a mutual um, or cooperatively owned bank uh, that they could develop in the city. You know, so it's a process of, of learning and figuring out what works, and you know, these, these things need to be and are place-based, these solutions. They need to come from, from the communities that they are meant to uh, serve, and, and that takes time. You can't just replicate. You can't just say, ah, that worked here. That worked in North Dakota. Let's just do the exact same thing here. No, you know, it takes time to reinterpret and, and, and take the pieces of it that, that work from one place and try and apply it to your own location. Um, so, you know, there, there, is a, there is a risk um, of, of, you know, uh, selling things before they're in place, but you also need the support um, as you tell that story as well. Um, and I think one of the things that occurs to me as you were talking about this is, you know, we've been throwing around a lot of technical terms, um, and in the interest of having a conversation about kind of what's shared and not terribly technical, but more about the process of movement building and catalyzing imagination. We've been, you know, we're not taking the time to outline, you know, every single technical detail about this stuff, you know, but, you know, German Sparkassen and CDFIs and permanent affordability through ground leases and all of this stuff is very complicated, right? It, um, it gets very technical, very wonky, very quickly. And I'm curious, Terrell, when you, you show up on a doorstep, right, and you've got like, what? five seconds, 10 seconds to convince somebody that they want to get involved to organize and fight for community land trusts. How do you, how do you explain this to somebody in a way that like cuts through the technical complexity and, and gives them what they need? Um, well, um, sometimes I'll ask them, how does your neighborhood work for you? Um, and I like to start with something like that where I'm not really expecting the answer just expecting you to start wondering mm. because it begins with um, wondering because with all the disinvestment that you have in a lot of neighborhoods it has kind of created I think like two like a twofold um, problem with organizing most people are 
apathetic to change. They, it's like almost like they don't they they don't imagine a different solution. <laughs> and two, you kind of have a, a attitude. Uh, I shared that attitude, so that's why I can speak on it. Of well, maybe it's something I'm not doing, which is why I'm in this situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So maybe I need to change my direction and in order to get out of here. And so basically just um, starting with that and then I like to lead off like, well, how would you change it if, if what's the name, like just start pointing out places like, yeah, how long has this place been vacant? And it'll be like three or four years. And I'm like, um, and uh, there are no there are no homeless people in this neighborhood, uh, things like that. And they'll be like, well, yeah, I'd see that. And I'm like, so um, is crime an issue? And they'll be like, yes, uh, yes, it is. And um, and I just try to connect the fact that all these different things are connected to one, the fact that they don't have any real say over how their neighborhood truly runs. Mm. And that in order to do anything, you all need to be able to come together and discuss these things. Um, that I like to, oftentimes I find myself where people, if I do a good job, people be like, well, how do I get involved? But, often, but you more often get where people be like, so you're trying to offer me a house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I had to like pump the brakes and like stop them there. Like, there's one, there's like, there's a big problem with that. One, I don't have a house to give you. I, I would love to, but if I gave you a house, how would you, how would you, how, how would you um, uh, manage to um, afford it mm. in this city? Mm. Um, as you know, how high um, um, rents are, sixteen, seventeen hundred a month. Um, there are some as high as 2200 a month. And people in these neighborhoods don't make anywhere near that. And so that coupled with the fact that there's not nearly enough affordable housing um, in the neighborhood and that the city has aggressively been um, working to destroy um, a lot of the est already established affordable housing or what they call affordable housing. And so, basically, like I said, my first pro approach is we have to we have to dream first, and then I'll and try to introduce you to the little small steps to get them to understand that the same way um, this neighborhood didn't get to this point from yesterday to today, it takes a long process to actually um, revitalize neighborhoods. Um, I like to tell them about different little things that we've done. Like when someone has said, well, what did you guys do about um, um, creating more affordable housing in the past? I was like, well, you know, we petitioned around the city. We, we took those petitions to City Hall to, and demanded a meeting with the budget office to discuss money being put forth towards affordable housing. Um, we, for lack of a better word, um, confronted um, our housing commissioner about his plans t um, to do um, large-scale development in the um, city and not including the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, which had been created and passed by the voters. Hmm. Um, we um, demanded that he come to a meeting, which he did, and we secured a two million dollars into that trust fund. And I like to tell them these little things to show that us working together is how we accomplish these little things. Your signature helped to do that. Uh, but that's not, it doesn't begin and end there. There's also those other things that, while they can seem a little tedious, are necessary to making these things work on a large, um, large scale. Cool. Um, I want to dig into this moment of confrontation um, and this moment of like, you know, when we actually, when we're building a new economy, um, we're going to run up against 
maybe an entrenched bureaucracy, maybe a housing commissioner who doesn't get it. Um, in the case of New York, you're going to run up against Wall Street, right? Um, and I'm curious, you know, I've seen a lot of really amazing things out of New York recently in terms of new economy policy. New York's put a couple of million dollars and actually an increasing annual amount of millions of dollars into worker cooperative development. Um, they've recently shifted a, a couple of million dollars into community land trust organizing, but compared to a 90 billion or whatever number of billion dollar budget that you were talking about, these are, you know, these are crumbs. Um, what does it look like when you go after Wall Street and you go after their bread and butter, like on their own turf? What, do you, what kind of resistance are you ex have you encountered or are you expecting? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a, it's a scary image. Thanks, there, John. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I mean, because because the campaign is you know in its um, in its beginning stages, there hasn't been that kind of inevitable pushback really uh, mm -hmm. manifest. But um, yeah, I think it's very wise to foresee that coming. Um, and, uh, and on, on multiple fronts, I think it's obviously uh, the banking sector itself <clears throat> is going to try to delegitimize and um, attack this effort as impractical, mm -hmm. um, as, as wasteful, as something that's going to be taken over by politicians. Um, but then I think on another level, too, there's, uh, there's the possibilities of, um, of it being let's say, implemented, and then not really meeting its mission, mm -hmm. right? To be kind of broken and watered down in a way that's not going to get to the, the kind of the transformative solutions that we're, you know, help building it to, 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 to achieve. So there's, there's multiple levels, and I think part of the solution um, that we're developing for those future threats um, is about how the coalition is, is building itself. So that just to mention a few of the you know the kinds of groups that are that are involved. There's um, at the launch, we had um, a leader with New York Communities for Change talking about uh, the housing crisis. Um, it was a leader from Flatbush, Brooklyn. And then we had um, a CEO of something called the Brooklyn uh, Cooperative uh, Federal Credit Union, which is a mission-driven uh, credit union that's um, you know designed to to serve low-income people. And then we had also a speaker that works with Enlace, which is a great group that, that talks about prison divestment and connects it to worker centers. So, um, so if, if at the beginning you're trying to kind of have these conversations, I mean, I hope we get to door knocking at some point. I don't think we're quite there, but it'd be cool to have you know conversation about that. Um, that they're going to kind of shift, like shape the vision, and then ultimately, if we want to talk about like governance of something massive like a public bank. We want to like study deeply what that would look like, but have a clear process of these kind of community leaders, that kind of deep expertise in credit unions and alternative, um, you know, non-extractive finance and things, so that they could then be um, on on decision-making board for that bank um, and able to to prevent some of those threats from 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 taking over. And I think you know, finally, too, uh, an important question is. I mean, I'd love to hear kind of in the CLT is like, is, is how you are committed to the grassroots, but then where do you have those conversations about such big, bold ideas? Um, I mentioned in LASE, they also convened something called the New York Worker Center Federation. They have a leadership institute. So what we try to do is create popular education materials, go to existing political education of groups around the city. In the case of, um, of the Worker Center for Federation, it's, it's, it's a dozen worker centers, street vendor project, restaurant opportunity center. And they invited us to talk about banking because some of the leaders in Enlace were appreciating trying to go deeper into the financial system to talk about racism, economic exploitation, and how finance relates to that. So having those spaces there, I think, is a great blessing and can lead to that kind of grassroots leadership. But yeah, taking it up to scale where it becomes an idea that, that really the masses of New York are participating in is, yeah, it's a slow, slow process. So um, stay tuned. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> you know, um, uh, we took a, in Baltimore, we took a, a multi-bucket approach to um, how we um, talk about and plan these kind of things out. Um, in communities, um, like, uh, we have created committees, like, um, mm. we have an east side committee, well, east side committee, a west side committee, um, 
like I said, the Curtis Bay area, they are kind of our South Side Committee. They don't go by that term, but <laughs> um, where they actually discuss both how they can be effective um, in the citywide movement, but how they also don't um, forget how they, how they also are able to have a space where they concentrate on issues going on in their own respective neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Um, unfortunately, you have certain areas where that does not exist, like Central Baltimore, which um, one of the people are in the process of trying to create a space there. Um, then we also have, like um, as I was saying, the Baltimore Housing Roundtable, which is where people from throughout the city come together and, and um, more focus on the actual citywide movement. Hmm. And when it comes to land trust, we have the share space, which is Different, the different people involved in land trust building um, who actually come together and both work on advocacy of the um, program for uh, at, at the city at the city level, but also on how to help each other. Like for instance, certain neighborhoods they may have never door knocked or things like that, mm -hmm. but they understand the need for affordable housing and for land trust opportunities, and pairing them with other members who've done more of the organizing, but it, ha it really has not truly been able to fully um, um, condense uh, actual approach on how they would actually set up their land trust in their area. Mm. Yeah, it's, like I said, it's um, a lot of spaces. It's a lot of spaces. But um, it gives people the opportunities to meet these issues which are large and encompassing um, at, their, at, their, at their level, mm. at their education level and grow into the movement. Cool. Yeah. So, so I think this question of you know, how do you start building towards bigger and bigger and bigger changes while still remaining accountable to what's going on at the grassroots, at the neighborhood, at the city level is really live in the UK. And I'm excited about the scale, um, especially as we're seeing you know, country after country, including this one, where if you have a kind of left presence that's really just you know, kind of selling the weak tea of kind of maybe nicer, more inclusive neoliberalism, we're seeing them getting wiped off the map, um, you know, whether it's what's happening um, here under Trump, whether it's what's happening in Italy. Um, and the UK is actually only one of the real bright spots of, of the political landscape right now. And I think it's in part because they've been willing to start to embrace really radical alternative visions at a, at a, a national level in opposition. Um, Sarah, but I was wondering if you could talk about how this creates, is there a tension here between what's going on as, as the stuff that's happening in cities like Preston gets translated to national policy? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the, the rise of, of Corbyn and, and sort of uh, the Labor Party um, re-embracing its more radical roots um, comes out of, you know, a number of years of, of the Labor Party sort of moving to centrist, and more neoliberal um, policies and, and adopting those, and as, as you said, sort of in this, in this soft left kind of way. Um, and so uh, Corbyn and, and what he represents is, is really an outcome of a popular movement in the UK, uh, especially through a group called Momentum, which is a youth-based um, uh, organization that really is driving um, labor to to really return to its socialist roots and, and articulate that in a meaningful way um, and in so doing labor you know is developing a economic platform that is based on what's happening in places like Preston and other places across the UK they put out a report essentially outlining their economic platform called the alternative models of ownership um, that that really centers um, local ownership um, um, and different forms of local ownership um, as part of their as part of their national platform. So um, you know th that's extremely powerful and um, uplifting. At the same time, um, you know this is relatively new. There's limited capacity to to really lead with this. Um, I think Corbyn's cabinet is uh, you know Corbyn's shadow cabinet is is five people. Um, 
doing all of this work and relying on sort of uh, their their grassroots base and what's happening in, in local cities and and things of that nature. But um, there really is a, a capacity challenge and, and it's possible that they could get into power um, you know, in the next election, uh, it, at which point these ideas will become imp implementable, which is really exciting, but also really um, scary because uh, you really need to understand how you can implement these very technical and complex ideas at, at a national policy level and, and figuring out who the right people to do that are and, and how to build that around um, where they are at the moment. Uh, so, so that's a challenge. A additionally, if, um, you know, if labor doesn't win the election or if labor doesn't is not successful in certain implementation, you have you there is um there is a danger to the local efforts um that have really gotten on board with that that um you know, they could be dismissed as, as part of a more unsuccessful national campaign. Um, so really, how do, you, how do you use that politics? How do you use that national level politics, but still protect the efforts at the ground so that they can keep moving regardless of what happens sort of at that national level? And, and that's what places like Preston and others are, are thinking through, how to build a coalition locally and ingrain um, these new ways of operating as a locality so that you can't just reverse it based on politics or, or based on who's, um, who's elected to the head of the city council or, or so forth. So how are you not just sort of creating new policy but also changing the way that institutions function internally so that it's a lot more difficult to, to reverse that or, or put it in the opposite direction. So, so you know, it's a, it's a multi-tiered game it's a, uh, and, and that's understood, you know, it's not just as simple as getting a national um, political party on board. Uh, there are all these other lasting um, efforts that need to be made so that this is, you know, this uh, uh, is ongoing and, um, you know, for future generations. So I think we have about 20, 25 minutes left. Um, I wanted to see if the AV folks have a wireless mic that we could use to open up um, some questions um, and honestly also input from the people out here. I know that this is a conference where almost everybody has an amazing story about how they're working to build something locally and the challenges and lessons. So I'm going to do that. And while we're getting that set up, I also wanted to see if any of our panelists have anything they, they're really dying to ask each other. Um, I would like to ask uh, about the public banks. Um, oh. oh, sorry. Um, I would like to ask about the public about the public banks. Uh, you mentioned trying to figure out um, where to invest the money. Mm. Um, have y'all had any conversations about that? Or because I know you're in your early stages, so yeah, yeah. And I think it's um, it's important to note too. And this has been a little bit of an organizing challenge. Uh, maybe you can relate to because when people think bank, the association is like this is where I put my money, right? Mm. Um, move your money means move your individual um, accounts into something else. So the fact that this bank is, is set up for strategic reasons to be for, for the city only has implications for where the investments go. So on the level of relating to the, um, the like ongoing and even intensifying like racist redlining that banks do, um, the borough of the Bronx is one of the most concentrated places of um, people that don't have bank accounts. Hmm. And so that there's check cashers and, and these real exploitative alternatives. Um, so in that sense, the, the approach of the coalition, since it has um, community development credit unions as a part, is to um, help those flourish. So that, um, so backing uh, Financial cooperatives, which then can grow in places like the Bronx, um, is one place. Um, there's also uh, like a group called South Bronx Unite, and um, and you know there's a lot of overlap between kind of the community land trust movement and the people that are working on the public bank. So um, either kind of providing direct financing or working through these uh, financial cooperatives to to spread community land trust as a model for. Um, deeply and permanently affordable housing, through mutual housing, so that's a real important priority. And then there's also, yeah, like, uh, like the growing worker cooperatives, um, a member of the coalition is, is the Working World, which is a loan fund 
that, um, that helps worker cooperatives get off the ground and grow <clears throat> with a particular kind of non-extractive loan policy. So, um, so their members also saying that, yeah, the public bank uh, could, could help that flourish as well. Um, so those are some of the ideas. I mean, one, one interesting idea too that I think we need to work on further is if the whole, um, one of the drivers is divestment because banks are clearly destroying the planet. Um, they're one of the largest financers of fossil fuels and like dirty, like the worst fuel, like tar sands. I mean, it's, it's like shocking how much Chase puts into that. So you say divest from that, but what do you invest in? Mm -hmm. Is that gonna be like a, basically a privatized green economy that is still just as racist? Or is it gonna be like a community controlled um, you know, system of solar panels in neighborhoods that have never had that, right? And how can the bank prioritize kind of these real community-led solutions that, um, that get to like, you know, um, a kind of environmental racism head on? So, I mean, those are a few ideas, but I think, I think we should, you know, hang out with our friends in Baltimore and discuss them further. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, if, if people have uh, things they want to uh, share or ask, um, please come on up to the mic and we'll, we'll open it up for a bit. And Peter, if you have anything you want to you throw in. No? Good. Cool. Hi, uh, John Root. I've been involved in the public banking uh, movement for a really, really long time. Um, the argument that they always use is that banks invest in things that are investable in and that will bring a return. And the promise of public banking is that it won't do that. In other words, uh, tar sands is profitable, so let's invest in it. What about all the things that you can't fund just because they're not profitable? So the city of New York's bank, or the, ba the city of New York doing business as the Bank of New York, does not have to be profitable. The point is, and, and I'm, at, it, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of trying to describe something so that I can ask the question, right? The, um, the costs of running the bank, are tiny compared to the amount of money that it's investing. So if it charged a fee instead of interest to cover the cost of its uh, operation, then it could invest in community land trusts and cooperatives into all of these things, and the benefit wouldn't be the interest that it gets back. It would be the growth in prosperity of the city. Have you been thinking about things in that direction or not? Is there some possibility of genuinely understanding that it's the depositor, it's the borrower who's providing the value, that banks do not get money from somewhere, they get it from you when they lend it to you through the promissory note? So I'm curious about that because it's, it's the only reason to do a public bank. <laughs> sure. I guess, I guess that question's for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. <laughs> and not to take with too much space, um, but yeah, I, th I think that's part of um, this education process, which I'm definitely g going through. Um, there's a lot of technical questions about once this bank exists, yeah, uh, how much, um, how much of, of, of its cost to run will relate to how much it can lend. Um, questions of, and you throw this $90 billion number out there, that's also, you know, a little complicated because money is coming in and out of the city at rates that we can't, like, even catch. It's part of the problem, as you might imagine. The city won't tell us exactly how much money is in which banks. We're working on that. We, we had one day identified, the last day of last fiscal year, um, which showed just on that one day that there was a billion dollars in Chase, for example. Um, but that could easily have been 25 billion. Like we, we, we don't know the rest of the day, so research committee hard at work, lawyers involved. Um, but the point is, yeah, that there's, uh, there's, there's money flowing through Wall Street, which it's using for all kinds of purposes um, all over the world, and it's making money off of those investments that have nothing to do with, with New York on any level, not to speak of New York's most um, marginalized communities and, and people working on social and racial justice issues. So yeah, I mean, that's a clear priority and that's why it's, um, it's been in our vision to support really particular kinds of investments that are you know, community-led and transformative in this way. And then, yeah, I think the last point is just how, um, 
kind of this idea of the power of public banking is, uh, is, is an interesting way to, you know, to reimagine economic justice um, at its roots. Because, I mean, if, you're, if, you're, uh, if your boss is like stealing your wages, like a lot of you know, immigrant workers are the case, um, how do you begin then to fight against that on the immediate level, which happens more and more, right, in this, um, in this economy, while then seeing that related to the fact that your whole neighborhood is disinvested from because of Chase's practices, or because the city is, is, is not prioritizing that. So I think it's about like a dual strategy in that way and, and prioritizing just like you described. Other questions or people want to share? Hi, I have two questions. One uh, for the Preston uh, project and one for Baltimore, just clarification. So for Baltimore, was um, is the 2020 paying for the, or was the tax paying for the 2020 plan or those are two different funding mechanisms? And then the question that I have for Preston is what was the shape of the pension fund um, when? What was the shape? Yeah, like how was the pension fund doing when the municipality decided to use it to invest in? Uh, uh, I have a quick answer to that. I, I'm not exactly sure. I mean, I think it was performing. I don't think it was one of these very high yield uh, funds, um, uh, but I don't, I don't know the exact numbers on that. Um, well, basically um, every um, year, the city basically crea um, creates what they call a capital budget. And that bu budget uses um, city raised funds, so um, tax would definitely go into it to fund different projects um, throughout, throughout that year um, and continual projects. And so, um, the city was planning to expand their bond issue by 15 million um, to around 80 million um, total every year. And so what we wanted to do was, since we were asking for um, 40 million, we wanted a, a great deal of that to come out of the increase that the city was um, adding to its budget for, um, for um, programs that they were planning to do. Um, mainly because we knew um, just how much um, work and ongoing work was necessary to um, begin um, um, changing the um, transformative work in these neighborhoods, but also because we've um, we knew that uh, affordable housing is the lowest um, funded area of our city's budget, and with the I don't like to say crisis because it's not an actual crisis. That's one of the things I learned through um, United Workers Leadership School which is another space where we discuss housing issues and the history of housing in our city. That basically, the housing market is designed to displace people and to keep displacing people. So basically, we wanted it to come out of those, uh, out of those funds that regularly go into projects every year. Um, to both divest money away from projects that we know are harming these communities, but also to um, make the budget more reflective of our values. So, was the tax, was the tax being used to fund that, or is it in addition to the um, It was, well, that was the um, general obligation bonds. The, there is an actual like surcharge that we are exploring now, and um, that's called the fund of trust, and that would be a tax on developers who do speculation throughout the city. We discovered that through our research that there are 20,000 transfers every year, and 75% or 16,000 of those transfers are um, speculators, trans non-owner, non-owners, um, people who don't intend to live in the properties, transferring properties from one to the other. Mm -hmm. 
Wow. And so we actually did um, um, what we're um, trying to get that passed right now, which would be um, like a nickel on every hundred dollars of speculation that would, uh, that would basically um, come up to 20 million a year. And so that was like more of a like an actual direct tax, mm -hmm. as opposed to the gold bonds, which is money that the city operates with every year. It wouldn't actually be an increase in um, taxes or anything like that because that money is money they already have collected. Mm -hmm. um, Peter, you wanted to say something about this, because I think. Yeah, I, it, it gets complicated, um, but there's a there's a, uh, a a chess match that's going on here. Um, one was to to mount political mobilization to change the capital budget, which every city has. Um, and yet in, in doing that um, and getting some traction for that, we also found that the budget process is not very transparent, doesn't have a lot of opportunity for us to influence it. Um, so in, in essentially losing traction in that campaign, not getting what we want in that campaign, we, sh we, we shifted to, um, let's focus on the, on the trust fund, create the trust fund, um, and it's not one, of, it, it was simultaneous, believe me. And then, um, once it became apparent that, the, uh, that we won the trust fund, it's there, and we're not gonna get the 2020 in the capital budget, Let's focus on putting money in the trust fund with a targeted revenue stream. So it's not like we started with 2020 and said, here, let's use a capital budget, and here's a revenue stream for those bonds. You know, those would be like revenue bonds or something. But no, we were just saying, re-envision the capital budget entirely. Mm -hmm. um, and then now we're on this stage. And we'll be back to the capital budget. But there's also some, some change under work around budget participation, budget transparency relative to capital budget, too. Lots of different circles <laughs> intersecting. I'd like to say that's kind of like um, what I wanted to say earlier. Um, I like to call it like poker face diplomacy. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, because like, um, mm -hmm. I'll give you an example of what I mean. Um, almost a little over a year to the day, our mayor spoke at uh, 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 May 13th event, it's called the United Not Blighted event, where we were we wanted to introduce to the city what exactly we were trying to accomplish and to get them to take part in um, this transformative moment. And the mayor was the opening speaker and, mm, sorry, the mayor was the opening speaker and she spoke of her um, continued support of um, 2020. That would eventually lead to, like I said, us doing the Rising Up Summer, um, which is the petition drive for 2020. And in November of that same year, the mayor, of, she avoided coming to the petition um, um, present, pre presentation at City Hall. And in December, she, along with um, the governing body, the Board of Estimates, which makes a lot of the financial decisions um, in, our, in our city, um, walk, um, walking back the 2020 commitment. Mm -hmm. And so while we're, at the same time, we have allies there who work with us to try to create um, policy change and more um, um, support, we also have people who will say one thing and do another and we still have to interact with these people mm. while at the same time keeping our base mm. um, energized and moving forward in the right direction. Mm. So yeah, um, that's kind of where like um, Peter was saying how our approach to the 2020 versus um, the funding the affordable housing trust fund were um, that we while we do like while we do want them to be aware of the fact that if you will not pass legislation that benefits communities and reflects our values we will we will um, pass it ourselves but at the same point 
you're not just going to sit there and not at least acknowledge the fact that we deserve to be in these spaces and that whether it's kicking and screaming or otherwise, you're going to move forward. Hmm. Hmm. So I think, can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think we have a little bit of time left. I want to use that time just to see, I think, were there a couple of people here? So maybe we can have just people who were dying to ask a question, throw that up. You know, all of you throw that on the table real quick. We'll let people have the last word, um, and then we will wrap up and go to lunch. Okay. Yeah, please. We're all being too polite. All right. Okay. <laughs> um, my question's for Sarah, um, and thank you, all of you. Um, this has been fantastic. Um, so, and I admit I haven't read the report yet. I'm really looking forward to, to doing so. Um, but I keep hearing a lot about uh, the investment flows and the procurement flows. Um, and it's really exciting, but I'm wondering what's happening on the production side to make sure that when we talk about localism, we're not just talking about enriching sort of middle class business owners, but that like what's happening to create the capacity for people who were just you know regular probably union workers in when this was an industrial town um, to have an ownership stake in the economy in Preston and to, to create new new models from, from the ground up that can take advantage of these flows. Let's get all the questions Just out so we get everybody. Hi, sorry, I'm a little short, so I'm going to try to do this this way. Uh, yeah, my question is related to rural economies. So I'm here with Rights and Democracy. We work in Vermont and New Hampshire. Um, I've done a lot of rural organizing over the course of my organizing history, and I see a lot of these great examples in urban spaces and in bigger communities or spaces like New York or Preston has like 300,000 plus folks. That's like half the state of Vermont. So <laughs> we're facing significant rural economic crisis. We have a suicide rate that's double that of veterans with our farmers, for example. Um, and what we see is that there's simply not the tax base or the population base to even create that initial funding source to then redistribute wealth. There's not wealth, right? There's not, we're very money poor in our rural communities. And so I'd love some more examples like the North Dakota Public Bank and how that functioned or other opportunities for our rural communities to do wealth redistribution, especially when there's not ginormous industry where the extractive economies that maybe could be uh, restructured or eliminated that would have created growth, like in Appalachia, where I also used to work, don't exist. Uh, when we literally don't have the capital to start with to redistribute, where do we go from there? And I'd love to hear some more rural examples from y'all, too. Thank yeah. you. So I think there's two more things people want to throw on the table. table. Yeah, these are bank-related questions. The first one would be what level of capitalization in New York City, and then something Sarah mentioned about a Preston model for a bank. They're looking at a cooperative model and how that would work, and if it's similar to the coalition that they're putting together in New York. Hi. Um, thank you. Um, my question is around radical imagination. Um, I was I worked with Enlace for like three years, and I did a lot of uh, policy around uh, anti-criminalization of people of color and immigrants. And there was a lot of frustration because at the same time that we achieved the victory divesting from Wells Fargo, then um, you know under the table they were investing in or. Wells Fargo was divesting from uh, one private prison corporation. Then um, under the table, they were investing in the other private prison corporation without us knowing or being able to like uh, follow that. Yeah. So, um, and also in terms of like immigrant uh, policies or migrant justice policies, um, we would spend years trying to pass a policy and then uh, one day to another, they would just, you know, um, eliminate it and um, all the work and all the resources going into that were um, lost, although you know there was a lot of mobilization. But my question is if you're thinking about different strategies um, that create self-determination in communities that don't really relate with like financing, but um, creating, um, I guess, like some type of production um, in the community and yeah. Yeah, thanks. Well, well, thank you for all of those great questions. I think each of them could be like a whole hour and a half panel. Um, but maybe if people want to peel off any of them and if you want uh, to lunch on any of them, because there's a lot of details, we can do that as well. 
Yeah, um, a lot of good questions there. Uh, just to your question about how is this not just sort of helping a middle class to become more middle class. Um, uh, there's a lot of awareness around that. Um, the, the unions are pretty uh, closely involved in this effort. Um, Unite and Unison are the two large uh, union um, representing bodies in the UK and they're not only involved in Preston and, and part of the, the collaborative effort in Preston, they're also part of um, the larger uh, labor movement, uh, labor party movement um, as well to discuss these issues. So that's certainly at the, at the table. Um, uh, there's also a very, I, I think, um, uh, strong awareness of, of the role for municipal ownership and public ownership and, and how to use that to, to create jobs and, and um, uh, expertise in place as well and how to use that as a training opportunity. So I'm happy to talk more about that later, but it is definitely on the radar. And I mean, this is a post-industrial working class town, so the vast majority of the people there are are working class, so there's there's definitely a focus on on that. Um, to the rural example, uh, there you are. Um, that that's a really good question, um, and you know that's that's uh, a, a, you know again these these are ideas that don't always replicate in other places, but they're pieces of it that work. Um, and for the past five years, uh, the Democracy Collaborative has been working with a network of Native American community wealth. Um, uh, actors in place, and um, some of those are urban-based, but a, a number are not. Um, and there are some really powerful examples coming out from Indian country um, around sort of reclaiming um, their own resources and assets and, and developing an economy around that. Um, uh, I'd urge you to look at uh, Thunder Valley Community Development Corporation um, on uh, the Pine Ridge Reservation. Um, in uh, South Dakota, um, uh, uh, there's been a lot of work also about sort of thinking through what local economies mean um, from the sort of cultural and values base of indigenous people. Um, and uh, um, my colleague or partners here uh, with a group called Hope Nation are here, um, and they've done some really interesting work around that um, and how to translate it to sort of the culture of, of communities rooted in in sort of landed place and what that looks like and how you can sort of plan for for land and um, uh, you know regenerative um, local economies for for those smaller communities. So really interesting examples coming out of there um, that I'd be happy to talk more about. Um, and then the banking model um, in in uh, the UK, uh, the cooperative model that they're looking at is actually what they call a mutual, um, and it is a cooperative form. But the but the local the local municipal Municipalities have a stake in that cooperative, so it's sort of a mix. Um, uh, there is now what's called the Greater London Mutual in um, in London. Uh, they're working on a similar model um, called the Avon Mutual, and there's a possibility that there could be one in the North for Preston as well. Uh, oh, you want to take the capitalization question, and then sure, yeah, um, yeah. I think um, you know, I'm just going to have to say that's under research. Um, it's, it's a large question and it's also a little bit outside of my area of, of knowledge, but um, the, the research working group is, is seriously studying that. Um, but that's, yeah, as, as I understand it, a central question in starting any bank, especially one that would be this massive, is, is capitalization, the initial funds which, um, which allow it to function and begin to lend, which then led, leads to other lending. Um, and I think, yeah, just to, to touch on um, a friend who I think works with, with, worked with in, in Lasse, um, asked an excellent question, uh, which I think is, yeah, is one for our movements in general. How, how does kind of, you know, the existing, for example, movement for black lives, which is obviously focused on um, police murder and police violence and criminalization, relate to, to questions of, um, of, of economic injustice, um, how does the formation of kind of the resurgence of, of prisons and cages really relate to disinvestment from communities and kind of like people becoming disposable and not needed for economies, right, especially in, in black communities and brown communities. So I think those are profound questions. Um, the Freedom Cities banner, which Enlace is a part of, as well as Million Hoodies and Black Alliance for Just Immigration, um, we're, we're talking to them in the New York context. Uh, we're going to be visiting Million Hoodies uh, in, a, in a couple weeks to try to get at yeah, what, is, what is our analysis of, of why criminalization is happening and how it might relate 
um, you know, in, in, in the very long-term sense to kind of what seem like separate struggles, but clearly are, are deeply intertwined. And Carol, any last thoughts on community self-determination or anything else? Um, well, like, um, thank you all for coming. Um, glad to see I was, that we were speaking to an empty auditorium. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I think that um, one of the major things that it comes to with community self-determination is um, re is rebuilding both um, the communities in the long run, but people in the short run. And, well, continue to build people in the short run. Basically, um, like what you mentioned um, just a few moments ago, um, we've come to the realization that like things like crime and disinvested neighborhoods, it all is meant to write a narrative that we are unfortunately starring in. Mm -hmm. And that we have to both realize the fact that that's going on and to um, both work to create positive examples that counter that and also to, um, to claim space, um, which is like what we did, um, like I said, with the, with the um, Braverman. We went to the Planning Commission, which you can, our city has a weird way of doing things. Hmm. You can come in and watch, but you're not allowed to really ask questions. Hmm. Hmm. And so, um, Basically, through just helping people to um, reclaim their voice and to realize that no, no matter what it is that you feel or, or, say, or, or want to say about your community, um, it's valid and that, it need, and that there has to be a space um, for it. I think all of those different things go into helping um, um, communities to move in the direction of self-control over their neighborhoods. Um, that's a really good place to end. I do want to say, uh, first of all, if you want to keep in touch um, with the work that's going on with Nesri, the work that's going on with Democracy Collaborative, um, the work that's going on with New Economy Project, United Workers, um, you can sign up on, on the list. <laughs> what? You can sign up on the list. Yeah. Sign up on the list. Wow. <laughs> okay. Sign up on the list. That was weird. Um, I was like, who's telling me to sign up on the list? Um, uh, up here, we'll share that with all the organizers. The other thing I, the other thing I want to say... Other, it's yeah. Bank of America it. doing that. <laughs> it yeah. All right. The other thing I want to say <laughs> is that... And I was really happy to see this. I was happy to see the sparks kind of shooting between, you know, oh wait, we should learn from Baltimore, right? Oh, we should learn from New York, right? We should learn from Preston here. And I think in the work that we're doing, uh, in the organizing that we're doing, in the ways that we support organizing that's happening, I think it's really vital to remember that these kind of conversations, um, whether they happen at a conference or whether you get people on a bus and you go up to visit a land trust in another city, um, these are vitally, vitally important to opening up people's sense of radical possibility about what could be different. And it oftentimes seems like a distraction from the work um, or it seems like something extra, but I will say that in everything I've seen that it's absolutely, absolutely key and I encourage people to support these kind of processes and, and conversations um, as a core part of how they build a new economy together. And thank you all for coming and thank you to our panelists. Thank you.